Horse nomads of the steppe has terrorized the civilized world for thousands of years. From ancient Egypt, to Rome, to Persia, all the way to 19th century Russia. With bows and arrows, and the ability to shoot from horseback, the horse lords brought death and destruction, and forged many great empires. The horse archers could shoot, and run away before the enemy could retaliate, thanks to their agile horses and superior composite bows. This brought doom to many unsuspecting kings who led their armies into the open steppe to face the horse lords. But the horse archer wasn't unbeatable. Many different civilizations across history developed strategies to deal with them, and these strategies worked just as often as they failed. In this video, I want to answer the question, how do you beat the horse archer? But before we get to it, please subscribe and leave a like. Enjoy! First of all, let's start with the strengths and weaknesses of a horse archer army. For the purposes of this video, we will be assuming that we are facing a pure step army that is made of tribal horse archers. There are tactical and strategic components to examine here. For those that may not know the distinction, tactical components mean things that will be advantageous in the moment of the battle, like the quality of the bows or the fighting ability of the soldiers. And strategic qualities are the ones concerning the larger picture, like logistics. Starting with the tactical strengths, the horse archers will have superior ranged ability due to their lifestyle and signature composite bows, superior mobility and higher quality soldiers, once again due to their lifestyle. A man who was born into the warlike tribalistic steppe society will have skills useful in the battlefield. Meanwhile, a European peasant levied into the feudal army won't have much in terms of fighting abilities. When it comes to weaknesses, the steppe riders are lightly armored, thus vulnerable, especially when forced to fight in melee range. Strategically speaking, the nomadic armies were once again highly mobile. In this context, it means that a steppe army could move 100 kilometers in a single day in right circumstances. Meanwhile, a standard medieval army averaged at 30 to 40 kilometers. This meant that the steppe armies could easily outmaneuver the regular armies and peck the moment of the battle. The steppe army could dictate the terms of the battle, as they could run away when they liked and fight when they liked. Except for ambushes, the only time you could face a steppe army in the battlefield was when they thought that they could beat you. If they didn't like their odds on that specific day, they could just run away. Meanwhile, if the same thing happened to a regular medieval army, they couldn't escape from the much faster step riders. On top of that, the mobile step riders made for excellent scouts and raiders. Another advantage of the step army was logistics. In the right landscape, the step armies didn't need supply wagons at all, as they could sustain themselves with their flocks and even horses. This both tied up to the speed of the army, but also meant that the steppe army was more or less free from logistical strains. However, this was also a disadvantage in the wrong terrain. The horses and the flocks of the nomadic armies needed open grasslands. Without the ability to self-sustain, the nomadic armies became extremely cumbersome, as Every soldier had several horses, and with medieval logistics, it was impossible to keep tens of thousands of men and horses fed. 
This is why we see nomadic armies composed of tens of thousands of horsemen, as they could sustain themselves. Meanwhile, the standard feudal army that depended on supply lines would be lucky to have a few thousand cavalry. And the other major weakness of the steppe armies was due to their social structure. The life in the steppe was harsh, and it was every tribe for itself. The tribes constantly fought each other. Only in the prospect of loot and conquest, the steppe armies could gather. More often than not, they had no concept of national loyalties. You didn't see proud knights pledging to serve their king or their god. These were bands of raiders, opportunists who were out for loot. Generally, a nomadic soldier wasn't in the field to fight to the death. He was there to gain easy loot. This mindset made the horse archers prone to running away when it came to show, because no loot was worth putting his life at danger. So, we got a list of the weaknesses and the strengths of a steppe army. And what we need to do here is to target their weaknesses, meanwhile avoiding their strengths. The absolute number one rule is, don't fight fair. Use ambushes, bring superior numbers, or fight in unfavorable terrain. The horse archers can't flank you if they're stuck in a narrow mountain path. They can't use their bows if they're stuck in a humid swamp. A lot of their advantages don't work in constrained landscapes. Fighting with a terrain advantage is the only foolproof way of defeating the horse archers. But what if it's not possible? What if you need to fight them in open terrain? Well, okay, there were two tried and tested medieval doctrines against the horse archers. The Western European marching column and the Eastern method, which was used by the Persians, Arabs and the Byzantines. Before I start explaining the two tried and tested methods, I just want to mention a common misconception here. The average history enthusiast's idea of beating the horse archers is putting your infantry in a circle and the archers inside the circle. So theoretically, the infantry can take the shots from the horse archers and then the archers can dish it back. Here is the problem though, such a strategy has never, ever worked historically. Aside from the battles where the nomads got bored or left due to other reasons. First of all, by turtling up, you are leaving the field control to the enemy. They can surround you, cut you off from supplies, prevent you from bringing reinforcements or getting to water sources. That's a recipe for disaster. But that's not the only problem. You are also willingly getting into a firefight with the nomads which is one of their strengths. Every single nomadic soldier was proficient with a bow and probably has a superior bow to yours, especially in terms of range. Keep in mind that the composite bow even outranged the famed long bows. The enemy can shoot you from outside of your range. And to reiterate, every single soldier of the steppe army is an archer. If it's a battle between forces of 10,000 each, the enemy will have 10,000 archers. Meanwhile, the regular feudal army would have a few thousand at best. That is terrible odds. But let's say that the firefight is going your way. The infantry protected your archers and they were able to inflict some casualties. Well, the enemy isn't stupid. They will not just wait in your arrow range to die completely one by one. They would retreat and try something else. Maybe a night attack or they can just wait you out. Remember, they have complete control of the field. You can't bring in supplies or reinforcements, but they can. Overall, this strategy has a nice fundamental with the infantry square, but it has nothing to finish off the enemy. It has no threat. 
At best, the formation will keep the horse archers just out of arrow range, but that's it. You have no real path to victory. What the Latins, mainly the Crusaders, changed in this formation was the addition of two elements. Turcopoles, as in light cavalry, and heavy knights. They fought fire with fire, cavalry with cavalry. First of all, you want to use your light cavalry and sometimes knights to deny the enemy the complete control of the field. You may not match the enemy head to head in a scouting battle, so what you want here is to threaten the enemy by achieving local superiority. You should be able to present a good enough threat to prevent the enemy scouts and units from straying too far away from their main army and prevent them from operating behind you. This will keep your rear reasonably safe and the supplies coming. And when the actual battle starts, you should repeat the same formation. Infantry with shields on the sides, heavy cavalry and archers in the center. The horse archers will once again surround you and try to harass you from distance. Except now, you have a hammer. After the enemy is tired and out of formation, you suddenly charge with your knights and bring a quick victory. The horse archers will not be able to resist against the knightly charge and will get slaughtered. Granted, this strategy isn't foolproof and depends a lot on luck alongside of various other factors. The horse archers may still manage to avoid your cavalry if they were far enough or if your knights are tired. If your men are undisciplined, they may break formation prematurely or your knights may get too far from their infantry support in the battle and get destroyed. The crusaders lost and won many battles using this strategy, but it was as good as it got. The main caveat with this strategy was that it could only work in small geographic distances. The square formation could be extremely slow, crawling speed basically. This would be fine if you were trying to get to Acre from Jaffa for example, but it's impossible to do if you are a Persian army in Central Asia with the closest friendly town being 500 kilometers away, with very few water sources on the way. This is why the marching formation, combined with heavy cavalry chargers, were only ever used in the Levant by the Crusader states. As the distances here were small, the lands rich and the terrain mostly mountainous. However, 2000 years before the Crusades were a thing, the Persians were fighting the nomads and they were winning. The Eastern Doctrine was based heavily around cavalry, namely the cataphracts. For a thousand years, Persian, Islamic, Byzantine and even Ottoman and Safavid cataphracts used similar tactics. There were many different variations of the cataphract, but it had two main qualities for our purposes. One, it was heavily armored from head to hooves which protected the rider and the horse from projectiles. This made the cataphract slower than the knights. Thus, it was very hard for a cataphract to catch the horse archers. Here is the catch though. The cataphract didn't need to catch the horse archer. The second quality of the cataphract was that he had a bow. The cataphract could serve as a mobile turret against the horse archers without having to catch up to them. Here's how the Eastern Doctrine worked. Once again, you would deny the complete field control through use of a lot of light cavalry and then use the cataphracts to dish out punishment to the horse archers while the light cavalry covered the flanks. 
an eastern army would have enough cavalry on its own to operate outside of a box formation, which gave them more flexibility. It would go on like this for a while, but at the end, being unable to harm the armored cataphracts with their bows, the step riders would either have to retreat with losses or get charged into melee range by the cataphracts. This doctrine was much more successful than the Frankish one. The cataphracts allowed, especially the Persians, superiority over their foes. Achaemenid, Sasanian, Abbasid and Samanid rulers were able to rule in the hearts of the Central Asian steppe for over a millennia, where the horse archers were supposed to be unbeatable. The cataphracts were so successful that, in a way, they brought their own end. In 10th and 11th centuries, the steppe nomads became more and more organized and started building more and more sophisticated states. This allowed them to field their own cataphracts. The Mongols had their Kashyyyk, the Seljuks had Mamluks, Ottomans, Sipahis, and Safavids, Ghulams. The nomads ruled Asia and Eastern Europe for 500 years through the combination of the mites of the horse archer and the cataphracts from the Seljuks all the way to the Timurids. And only the age of the gunpowder would bring the end of the horse archers of the steppes. Thank you for watching. If you liked it, please subscribe and I will catch you in the next one.